latest train ever run down America's railroad track was that orange blossom special bringing my baby back. But now the Amtrak scatters, she's peaceful to the old. And that orange blossom special don't stop water in the old. Oh, that orange blossom special don't stop water in the old. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless Jimmy Wise. <laughs> oh, boy, getting the key of D. My, my price just went up. Your price go up? All right. <laughs> That's all right. You ain't going to get paid no out, so it's all right. Go ahead and raise it. All right, Tommy King, now we're going to take a ride on that Lee Highway. Are you ready? Here we go. How old were you when you started playing? About seven years old when I first started. But I started playing the fiddle when I was about 12 or 13. And uh, of course, I'm just a young fella. I'm just 78. And I've been playing a long time. Well, uh, just practice is about all I can tell you, really. I put in a lot of hours on what I know. Uh, I used to get the my friend, I'd say, well, Mama didn't send me to the corn crib to show up corn every time. She told me to take that fiddle and get out of there with that noise that I made or she's going to kill me. So it's just practice, to be honest with you, just a lot of practice. That's what I learned. And, uh, of course, back in my days, they didn't have a TV and the fine fiddlers. You had to uh, just catch somebody could play and just imagine that you would hear what they were doing and take your fiddle out and practice and try to get it as good and as smooth as you could. Yeah, an old hoedown called Cherub, and it hadn't, nobody played it but just in the old time Florida fiddlers. And of course, uh, back in them days, if you play Sally Gooden and Cherub, well, you was a good fiddler. Are you going to play one of those tonight? Uh, no, I probably won't because uh, the people wouldn't know what I played 60 years ago. I'm going to try to play what they hear today and what they enjoy. down a little bit now and gonna do a blues that's wrote about Florida. Incidentally I'm a Florida cracker. I was born in half raised over in Lake City, Florida. And uh you know fellas y'all might not know that I'm kinda of proud of myself. Yeah. Yeah, two states claim me. Florida and Georgia both claim me. Yeah. Georgia claims I'm from Florida and Florida claims I'm from Georgia. <laughs> but but nevertheless this tune is about Florida. You probably remember it. One called the old Florida Blues. Here it is, boys. <laughs> Uh, and that's, I've done that ever since I can remember. I love music. Uh, when I, I started out when I was about seven years old, playing the old drop thumb style banjo like Grandpa Jones or String Bean. And I fooled around that a while and that didn't exactly suit me. So finally I got a whole new flat top guitar, played around another that while, that still wasn't it. But the first tunes I learned, I learned how to play on the fiddle. I said, that's my instrument. And I've hung in there with it for about 60 years. Well, uh, I accumulated this style, but the way I feel, I, I love good tone. I like uh, long, lonesome, bluesy notes. Uh, a lot of the young fiddlers today, they're some great fiddlers, but they, they uh, like to play more notes than they do. I take one note and I just kind of milk it and, and make it long and bluesy and lonesome if I can and get a lot of tone. I get as much tone quality as I can out of a note. And that's, that's why I'm branded as a, uh, the fiddlers say, well, you've got a, a tone that big, Chubby. Well, that's how I get that. It, it is a, a, the amount of notes that you put, it's the feeling you put into one note. That's, that's the best I can explain it to you. <laughs> Florida Blues. 
Hallelujah. Well, boy, get the kids here now, but we're going to do this little novelty thing. Somebody want to hear this. We can call it Cats and Hen. And if you listen real close, you're not running a Red Eyed Rolling. No, Rhode Island Red. I can't say nothing right tonight. Might run a Rhode Island Red Rooster in on you before this thing's over with. Kids, here we go, boys. Well, uh, well, as long as I'm able to go around and put that fiddle under my chin, because I guess that's part of me, that fiddle. I, I, I wouldn't know what to do. I'm like George Jones. I don't want no rocking chair. So <laughs> as, as long as I'm able to beat the roads and play the fiddle and, and put a little sunshine in people's lives and the good Lord continues to be good to me and he keep, let me keep my health, fellas, that's just how long I'm going to play. I'm about 78 now. And if I let it be 178 and feel like it and can do it, I'm still going to be playing that fiddle. Ladies and gentlemen, Chubby Wise, how about it? I remember my first fiddle when I was three. Um, my family, we have a small shop in Dublin, um, a small little shop that sells hardware primarily, but we also sell musical instruments and cigarettes and all kinds of stuff. But um, my father had a small, tiny fiddle at the time, and of course I couldn't play. I mean, at three years of age, you can't play. But it was the notion and the idea that that um, is placed in front of you. So I remember having this tiny, small fiddle, and I remember as a child carrying it around me, and I remember feeling really important. And my father used to he he used to sit me on his knee, and he would um, he would put his left hand around my left hand and press it down on the strings, and he would hold my right hand around the bow, and he would make me pretend that I was playing and go through the motions of playing when in fact I wasn't able to play anything at all but it was the idea that was that was uh, put forward to me and of course from um, the repetition of, of uh, the practice and also uh, seeing people playing in that um, I, I wanted to participate and that's kind of how it started for me. But my father was a fiddle player and a concertina player and he taught me how to play um, and all my family um, so I didn't, the only formal lessons I had were within the last 12 months I, I'm trying to study for a degree and I had the opportunity to study uh, violin and piano and different things, music theory and so on so that was the first time in my life that I, I had those opportunities so I decided to spend a couple of months with a, with a teacher in Miami but um, with regards to my own musical tradition and background I've had no formal training at all, it's all by ear. I'm sure the people who are trained enjoy it just as much as people who uh, wouldn't have any, uh, wouldn't have any, have any, have had any formal training. I mean, you see, the tradition that I come from, if there is formal training involved, it's a kind of a negative thing, you know, because our tradition was passed on from generation to generation. So, if you're, a, a, let's say, a musician who has ha who has had classical training and it comes through, those sounds come through in your music. Well, that's a thing that they don't really look too kindly on. Do you get my meaning there? I, I don't mean that they're against uh, classical musicians in that sense, but any kind of a classical flavour and an influence in traditional Irish music, let's say, for example, something like vibrato in the music, um, strong vibrato, it wouldn't be considered traditional at all. I grew up in the city of Dublin, which is the capital city of Ireland, so my own style would be um, 
you know, I would have been exposed to all kinds of um, music from around Ireland and my, my own particular style would be a, a mixture of music from Donegal and County Sligo and uh, County Clare, primarily those three counties. Um, and I'd have, to, I'd have to describe to you the, the different aspects of their styles to explain to you what the differences are. But, but I'm kind of a, I take influences from here, there and everywhere. Pete Gallagher said that you're, you're regarded as the, the world's greatest living Irish fiddler. I mean, is, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's rubbish. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, with what I do, I do the best I can playing. And I know, I know, you know, a lot of the players out there and people do different things and you take things from people. You might do one thing for me and you might do something else for me and somebody else. So. I don't really believe that there's any such thing as the world's greatest this or that. It's all a matter of interpretation, particularly when you talk about music. See, if I was a tennis player and I was beating everybody at tennis for 10 years, maybe then you could say he's the world's greatest tennis player. But music is a different thing. Because when you, when you go above a particular level, it's like a work of art. It, it's, it's a matter of um, who moves people in a certain way. And what you may consider is the best for you may not be what's the best for the next person. You know what I mean? So I, I, I'm embarrassed when people say those things to me because I, it's just not true. Why, why don't you pursue fiddle playing? Well, I have a wife and I have two children, two young children, and I, I was playing professionally for about nine years and I just decided that if I'm going to be a professional musician all the time, I have to travel all the time and I didn't want to do that at that particular point in time. So I've just put it on hold for a while and um, in a couple of years time I hope to go back to being a full-time musician. Oh, uh, Elaine and I have been talking for years about possibly putting on a, a fiddle contest that was fair and we, he and I had entered a lot of them. He's a fiddler and I play guitar. And we've entered a lot of them. Most of the time we never won. We never even came in the top ten when we thought we did well. And there's always complaints. And we talked for years about it. And when this opportunity came up with Chief Billy, I contacted Elan and we just thought we'd uh, uh, try something. We called it Fire on the Swamp after that old fiddle tune, Fire on the Mountain. And uh, uh, Elan really is the one to talk to here about uh, the, the contest and how it went and everything. And I just kind of produced uh, the event. Tell me, uh, what are your impressions of this first Fire in the Swamp fiddling contest? Well, I, I really I enjoyed uh, this first weekend for several different reasons. The location is beautiful. Um, for me, where I live, which is in Miami, it's not too far away. It's about an hour and a half drive. And there, there was a great lot of enthusiasm from the um, participants in the in the competition. Competitions, I should say, because we had three different competitions. And... Um, the Seminoles, the people that I met, I didn't meet many of them, but the ones that I met were very positive and very enthusiastic about the weekend. And on top of that, the organizers um, seem to be really happy and they're hoping to do it again next year. So I'm really delighted with the weekend. And of course, we had Mark O'Connor here yesterday and um, it was wonderful to see him and to meet with him and, to, and to hear him talking. So. It was very good, and uh, as Pete uh, suggested, it was a very fair contest. Uh, I've had no complaints at all about how the order was of the people finishing. The fiddlers thought it was good. People thought it was good. What, judging you know by what they heard, the way the fiddlers played, the level was very high. I had many comments from the fiddlers that the level of playing was quite high, and perhaps the most unusual aspect of this event and which makes it quite singular is that we had a swing contest which to my knowledge and to the knowledge of the fiddlers here had never been done before and was greatly welcomed so we had for the first time a swing contest and uh, that was very well received both by the public and by the fiddlers
contest. And it, everybody seemed like they had a good time. I know the turnout was not what we might thought it would have been, but they say it takes a long time for something like this to grow. What do you see as the future of this that's, festival? That's true. I've heard this said many times that when a person wants to put on, oh, say, a bluegrass festival or something, that it takes more than one year to, for it to get going. It could be a real contest. This is the first one, isn't it? And this could be one of the biggest fitness contests that's ever been. And of course, uh, you've got to have three or four to get it off the ground. It's like a bluegrass festival. I have played bluegrass for the last, I might say, 20 years. And uh, if, if a man can break even for the first two or three festivals, he's lucky before he ever gets it off the ground and starts making it all out. So that's the way this is. It, it'll, I don't see no reason why they couldn't be the biggest fiddler contest it's ever been in the state of Florida. The judges, depending on the contest, take, for example, the Texas contest style fiddling, look first of all for good rhythm and good intonation, and for an expressive quality of playing, for playing that uses fiddlistic devices, little slides, little turns, things that make fiddling different from playing violin, for example. They also look for how difficult the tune might be and how appropriate it is to the particular contest. And they look for how well the contestant does his tune, whether he pulls it off the way he wants to. It's a very difficult thing to do to judge a contest like this, and I think the judges did a fine job. Thank you very much. We finally come to the moment that the fiddlers, for certain, have been waiting for, and their friends and fans. And now we're going to announce the the uh, prizes, and uh, Chubby Wise is going to hand the ribbons and congratulate each of the fiddlers as we go. We're going to start with the, uh, the uh, fifth contestant who uh, beat out all the other places for, to get his fifth place, and it's no small accomplishment. Uh, Mr. Rick LaRue, fifth place. I like to pla practice in the bathroom. Let's go on in there. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. Come on, let's get a real shot. It sounds just like it does when you're playing into the mic and it's reverberating out on the grandstands. It's that same echo, plus or minus a flush or two. Sounds a lot better to me though, in here than it does out there. What does it feel like right before you're going on here for a uh, <laughs> Nervous. Why are you nervous? I think it's because the ears are actually listening for a change. Usually you play and it's just your ears and, and you know what you expect out of yourself and, and you can get it, but you're playing for yourself. But all of a sudden you're really playing for other people when you're, you're being judged. That's why you're nervous. competition yesterday but he got away from us so he's going to have to accept his prize right now Mr. Jay Roberts winner of the swing competition <laughs> first prize in the swing competition was five hundred dollars let's have another hand for Mr. Jay Roberts he also gets a beautiful Seminole jacket. I have been coveting this jacket all weekend, but is now the possession of Mr. J. Roberts.
For fourth place, open, and the prize is $250, Mr. J. Roberts. In the open competition and winning $500 is Mitch Corbin. What I'm li uh, listening for basically is the, is the people's command of the instrument. Um, and that's all the different aspects, the technical aspects of how they bow the instrument and how they finger the notes and the strings and so on and uh, how it all comes together. How difficult the, the, the pieces of music are and how well they, they play difficult passages because usually the better players will make the more difficult pieces and the more difficult passages sound easier than they actually are. So I'm, I'm, I'm really listening and, and watching for technical uh, things. although. One thing to mention, which was very enjoyable this weekend, was the fact that we didn't see the competitors because we were we were um, sectioned off away from them, so we didn't actually know who was on stage at any time. All we had to deal with was the actual sound of the music itself. So, um, so that was terrific. I think it's a good thing. Twelve years old. What do other kids? What do, what do other kids say to you about this building? They think it really, really is a lot. It really is neat. They don't. They like doing it themselves. Most of the friends I know play the fiddle themselves. I started by when I saw my teacher in a paper, so I uh, called up on called up him up in the paper, and I asked him if I could start playing the fiddle, and I started that day. How long you been? Three years. You only been playing three years? Yes, sir. And you're doing this well. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite style or type of music to play? Country breakdowns. Country breakdowns. Tell me more about that. Well, I have a lot more fun playing those than any other because I can jam with more people more than more most of the night, and I have more fun. I can make more variations on the stuff. I have better ideas to do with country breakdowns. It's my favorite style of music. Second place in this contest is $1,000, and first place is $2,000. The winners of the $1,000 second place and the $2,000 first place are respectively John Nile and Tommy Cordell. What does it mean to you to come in second place in this fiddle contest? A lot. <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, it's, uh, it's my first second place in a major competition for the Open Division, so I sh I'm really happy about it. You want to make a career of this? <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't try to make a career, but I don't know. I really haven't thought at all about what lies ahead or with why I'm going to do fiddling for teaching or something like that, but I sure do love it. Oh yeah, well I, I, I mean, from the point of view of the tradition, the young people um, are the avenues that we hope will bring us from generation to generation and uh, we had a great number of young people here this weekend we had a great lot of enthusiasm from those people and they're the ones that are going to carry on the tradition for us tomorrow so I'm really and truly uh, delighted to see all the young people and their enthusiasm
Well, this is happening because there's been a major change in the way fiddling is learned. Today we have cassettes and video cassettes, all means of, of learning music, and it's simply changed the whole element of folk music from what it used to be. You have uh, seemingly prodigies coming along now that achieve, by the time they're 12 years old, what used to take 30 years. What's your favorite kind of fiddle to play? What's your favorite music to play? Uh, bluegrass. Bluegrass. Why is that? Uh, you can put your heart into it. You know, you don't have to play so much technique. You can just play what you feel. You know. About uh, 20 years. Did you do this for a profession? Yeah, this is my profession. What, what, what are you playing? I, I used to work with a lot of top bluegrass bands, and, you know, road bands, and then I played some country bands too. And then, uh, right now I'm just doing one nighters, you know, like conventions and parties and Disney World. There's one additional prize that the grand winner receives. Another beautiful Seminole jacket. How does it feel to win his first fire on the swamp in the middle contest? Uh, it's a real compliment. I wasn't expecting it to be truthful. Because I play a bluegrass style fiddle. But the judges was leaning, they, you could do that if you wanted, so I wasn't really expecting it. Yeah, I had a bad accident a couple years back and kind of sent me back, you know, sent me back, but now this helped pick me back up, you know. Yeah. You got time for two or three more? I'll tell you what, let's do, uh, let's do one, hit the key of G. Up tempo, little thing here called, uh, under the double buzzer. No, under the double eagle. Yeah. Eagle, yeah. G boys. <laughs> We do have one more presentation which uh, slipped my mind for a moment and this is a really good one too that we're all going to enjoy. Would Mr. James Billy please come out and present. Again I'd like to tell you when I first heard of this man's name I thought he'd say Chubby's Wives and I come looking all over his wives and then finally, I finally come to realize it was J it's wise. and. Um, you are an inspiration to my soul. I enjoy your songs. Thank you. It's just like, you know, you you said, you said you always have a little favorite thing that you do when you sing. It's like Christmas time. Everybody puts angels up there. My favorite's always a star. The reason why? Remember that star guided everybody to where he was laying. That's pretty neat, isn't it? He's a fibber too. We tried it on him to make sure it is. What a wonderful surprise. That show talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.
Never has been nice playing to you. We've enjoyed it. We hope that you've enjoyed it and we've made your day a little brighter. Bro, little sunshine in your life. We appreciate you being here with us. It's not the biggest crowd in the world, but I'll tell you what, this is the first one, and I understand they're going to continue to have them. And if you just keep coming on down, being with us, in about three years, you won't recognize this fellow's contest. It'll be the biggest one that's ever been heard of in the state of Florida. Take my word for it. We're going to have a lot of fine fiddlers, and we'll have new talent every year, I'm sure they will. And I'm looking forward maybe to coming back again a bit, will you? You know, speaking of a small crowd now, this ain't little. Over here in WRUF, I was working with the group. We drove all the way across Florida to play a, a show in Georgia at a great big school. Got there, the nicest school auditorium you've ever seen. Big, wide stage, pretty curtain, nice PA set and everything. Got ready to put on the show and walked out. Pull the curtain. There's that one man on the front row. One man. I walked up to him and I said, Buddy, I want you to know we appreciate you coming out. And to show you how much we appreciate it, we ain't going to leave out one fiddle tune, not one song, not one joke, not one hymn. We're going to give you the complete hour and 45 minute show. That's how much we appreciate you coming out. He looked up at me and said, Well, I wish you'd hurry up and get it over with. He says, I'm the janitor. I'm going to lock up and go home. So we, we got a pretty good crowd after all night, ain't we? <laughs> well, folks, we know they have the old Indian saying, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Good night, everybody, and God bless you.